the common refrain is about policy and the vagaries of policy. We do not know what the government wants or thinks and, and therefore that is a problem in terms of planning. Thank you, sir, for bringing the, everyone together. Hope serious discussions and decisions do take place. As far as I am concerned, I represent a company called Navabharat Limited. We are into palm oil cultivation. From the morning, you've been hearing a lot of stories about how palm has grown and what its future can be and what it can be not. My two bits of advice, please take everything with a pinch of salt. Yes, all of us have dreams, all of us have expectations, but the devil is in the details. How do we implement it? How can it be implemented? And what can we learn from our past work especially from people already in the field. We've heard our farmer Maranachal has all the difficulties he had. So yes, there is a lot of potential, but we need to be cautious about it. We started in the year 1991. We now have reached 23,500 hectares after 30 years of work. So when people tell me they can achieve one lakh hectares in one year, I am a little skeptical. We have a 150 ton per hour palm oil mill. As far as commitments to sustainability goes, we are fully committed. And hats off to the policy makers in 1991, where they foresaw all the requirements of sustainability. The program document is revealing, and I only realized it when I sat with RSPO trying to figure out the guidelines for the RSPO guidelines for uh, India. Our systems are far, far, far ahead of what they expect. But they do not believe us. They want a certificate. They want a certificate telling us that we are sustainable. And that certificate costs a lot of money. And that's where the problem comes. How can we get our certificates at a sustainable price? Let the oil be sustainable. First is, how do we get a sustainable auditing system? Someone in Costa Rica or someone in Malaysia has to come to India to teach us sustainability and certify our methodology whether it is sustainable or not. The very basis of this policy is substitution of crops, which implies no forest. That is itself sustainable. But no one wants to believe us. There is a pricing mechanism which is open and transparent, where every farmer knows what price he is getting it and how it is calculated. I agree most of the smaller farmers who are not in contact may not know the mechanism. But it's an elaborate mechanism. Mutual discussions take place between the government, the processors, and the farmers, and a price is fixed. It is linked to the market, where the value of the fruit is shared 75% to the farmer and 25% to the processor. All the expenses of the, and profits of the farmer has to come in that 75%. Similarly for the processor, he has to limit his expenses and get his profit from that 25%. Now, why do I bring up all these things? Because there's essentially a mistrust in this whole system. No one wants to believe what the processor says, and no one wants to believe what the government says, or no one wants to believe what the farmer says. All three mistrust each other. Then unless there is a trust between the three, and we agree that what figures we give are good, this cycle will continue. Now, from this part, uh, time of sustainability, no one can say no to sustainable. I don't think anyone will ever say that sustainable is not necessary. But like the policy changes, even sustainability is devil is in the details. We as processors are the result of, I would say, be the victims of the funnel effect. There are many stakeholders who have many agendas in the situation. Each one wants 
that bottom farmer and the producer, like Madam said, expectations. The NGO has an expectation. The industry, the consumer has an expectation. The policy maker has an expectation. Each one puts his conditions into the soul system. And finally, who has to bear the effect of it? It is the producer. Now, is he compensated for it? I don't think so. In a situation where he has to compete with the market, who is going to pay him for that extra effort to bring in these systems? Because no producer ever guarantees me that he will buy my oil. He says, you go get your certification. We will look at it after you get your certification. Now what do we do in such situation? Do we put the money up front? So I think uh, RSPO has to relook at this whole auditing process and the cost of auditing. Second, as India, we have a policy which is sustainable. So instead of asking every single processor or farmer to be certified, can you not certify the whole schema which is given by the government? So as long as we follow the schema, I think every one of us is certified sustainable. So I think that is a situation which you really have to consider it. I did put it up to Ashwin and others when we were discussing this, but it is much higher than their pay grade. Much bigger people will have to take it up with the government at the state level and the center, that when we do have this policy, there has to be a dialogue between the senior people saying that if all these procedures are followed, then why don't you allow India to be declared a sustainable producer? That is my part of my complaints. Now, as far as Navabharat is concerned, we are committed to sustainability more out of our interest in sustainability than actually the commercial value of sustainability. This year we've uh, recycled 80% of our POME. Hopefully by March or April we'll become a, the first palm oil mill in the world which will have a zero liquid discharge situation where no water will come out of our plant. Zero liquid discharge, by normal terms, people will not understand it. But in palm oil, for every one ton of fruit that we process, we get 60% water. And handling that water is difficult. It comes at very high CODs. And that is a burning issue for everyone in the industry. We stuck with it. We managed to break through with it. We have produced, I mean, we processed so far around 2,80,000 tons of fruit this year. We'll close at 3,45,000 tons of fruit. 80% of the water generated from that has been recycled back to the boiler. We bring it down to boiler grade quality and then you reuse it. So we are quite proud of our achievement there. The next one is the bio waste, which is created, vegetable waste, I would call it the empty fruit bunches, the fiber, the shell, we have consumed 100% of it. We are not thrown a single piece out, now we store it out, we don't even keep it outside. As it is produced, we consume it. We have found methods and pro procedures to consume all the vegetable waste that we get. The joke in our company is that the only thing left for us is the ash from the boiler. P part of that joke is that we already sell 50% of our ash. <laughs> okay, so hopefully by next year we'll be even selling 100% of the ash. And then we'll have a zero waste company. So this is not uh, a way of bragging, but essentially telling people that if you do have the commitment, you will find a way to be sustainable. No one needs to certify you, no one needs to tell you what to do. You have the commitment, you can be sustainable. 
again to all NGOs, I recommend a book called The Tyranny of the Anointed, written by Thomas Sowell. I gave it to Ashwin yesterday, an expert from it, which basically says that there is some groups of people who take it on themselves to tell the world how it should behave and what it should do. And I think that is tyranny. Allow us to do the things the way we want to do it. Trust in us that we also want to be sustainable. It is not only some people outside who want to be sustainable. The industry too wants to be sustainable. Thank you.